All right, your grading options, MSR grades for Southern Yellow Pine. Uh, historically, in the, let's say the near uh, past since 1990, you've had 1650 F, that's the F sub B value, up to 3000 F sub B. Those, that was the general range that you were looking at. Uh, everything below 1650, that's where your visual grades started to kick in. Your number two, two by four, for example, used to be 1500. Um, it's now changed to 1050. So that's that 30% drop we were talking about. So there's now more interest from manufacturers to produce that same two by four number two that they were producing, uh, but test it to see if it's strong enough to meet these 1500 or 1650 guidelines. That would allow them the ability to take your material, process it, and then turn around and be able to sell it with the same similar yields of what they used to have. Now they recently increased the number of available MSR grades from 11, those were the 1650 to 3000, to 29. Um, they used to have those grades a long time ago, but nobody was really using the low grades. Everybody used the number two um, in lower grades. But now that uh, these design values look like they're going to be changing, uh, they've really, uh, they've gone back and added 20, or um, what is that? They've added 18 more back to the book. The machines, uh, an MSR and an MEL machine, you can use the exact same machine to produce both of those types of, of products. The only difference between those two, MSR and MEL, is your daily offline QC. In MSR, you're required to do bending testing and, and get your E values as well, so bending and stiffness. MEL also requires to do an additional tension test. So there's a little bit, a little added benefit as from a safety factor, knowing that you have also tested the tension. That can be very, MEL can be very important in things like the bottom cord of a truss where you have tension on that piece. Uh, glue lamb, the bottom lamb on, that, on a glue lamb is in tension as well. All right, the different types of machines. We talked about the, the flatwise bending machine that's been out there for a long time. The technology for, for tapping the end of the piece or thumping the piece and getting, reading that sonic transverse vibration has been out there for a while too, but it's never really been accepted on a, on a high speed full scale method at the sawmills. Well, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of, uh, we've seen two machines come over that have gotten a lot of uh, installations in the US where they're starting to, that board comes down in a production speed setting. So you're talking about, you know, it can be one board every second going past this machine. When it goes past it, it has a little hammer that thumps the end of the piece and there's a microphone immediately right behind that that's reading the sonic uh, information that comes out of it. I don't know how it does it, but it does that. Uh, and there's a correlation between that sonic wave and the MOE and the F sub B. There's also x-ray systems out there. Those have been around for a while, but again, most of the new systems that you're seeing coming on the market nowadays are these thumper systems. The impacts on the sawmills. Who buys this machine? Um, the benefit of having an MSR machine is if your market demands it. If the market is not demanding it, nobody wants to you know, put down three or $400,000 to get one of these machines installed. Um, that's for one of those thumper machines. Uh, the bending machines sometimes cost even more than that. Uh, this is a, an interesting number. Uh, before all this started, uh, before the first talk about this, we only had four accounts uh, that were routinely running MSR at their mills. Because there's always been a niche for that, but just hadn't been that big. Um, so this is on the supply side, obviously. After that, uh, we're, we have 20 accounts that are looking to get into this MSR program. As of right now, we've got about 13 of those accounts that are actively qualified to produce MSR. The other ones of the, that I'm talking about, the balance of these seven, they've got the machines on order, they're gonna be installed. So we'll have just uh, under the TP umbrella, 20 accounts total that are doing this. Now look at this, I don't know if this means anything to you guys or not, but east of the Mississippi are 17 of those accounts, west of the Mississippi are three of those. One of them's in Texas. So that's a little bit about the design values. Uh, if you want to get some more information about the projected design values, you can go to the SPIB website, spib.org. It'll be on their homepage. You can go to SFPA's website. I kept this kind of brief. I figured there may be some questions that come out. Somebody want to test my math skills. I hope nobody does. But, um, but no, does anybody have any questions about the design values or what the sawmills are doing with this?
I, I couldn't tell you. The only correlations that we've seen is, are some of those pieces that had uh, a lot of juvenile wood in them seemed to be a weaker piece than the pieces that did not. Now, keep in mind, we did not track any of this lumber back to the forest and confirm was this plantation grown. All that information is anecdotal at best, um, but I wanted to pass it along to you all and, and have it here as a topic of conversation. I have a feeling a lot of your questions are probably going to be directed towards the forester that will be up next. But try me anyways. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And uh, that's a math question above my pay grade. But there, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, Mississippi State uh, has spent a lot of time going over these values. That was one of their big concerns was the variation on how the samples were randomly pulled. Um, the time of year was another thing. Some people, uh, again, anecdotally, like we were talking about, some people think that if, you, if you're pulling in the wintertime, uh, you're pulling a different candidate stock than what you're pulling in the summertime. Um, it very well could be true. Uh, I mean, if you can only get into those wet spots uh, at a certain time of the year and another time of the year you're forced to go up on the hill to, to get those trees, it may be a different tree. My question really relates more to is there a large variation in those values? Or is it, is it you know, within expectation or is it, are there large variations? I don't know. I just don't know. Um, all this data uh, is available at, through ALSC. Um, and if you're good at math or know a good statistician, they could probably tell you. Yes, sir. In your testing of the number two grade, mm -hmm. how do you or do you control the location or size of knots? That's a good question. In the number two, two by four grades, it doesn't matter how many knots you have down the piece. Let's talk about that first of all. It's that one biggest knot. So when it breaks, it's going to break at that one knot. Well, that knot could be on the very end of the piece to where it does not come into play on the actual bending moments of when you put it in that, that blue bending machine that I showed you earlier. So what we do is we try our best in the, the testing process to take that defect and try to get it, um, get the board turned where the, the defect, I'm sorry, the grade stamp is consistently on one face and on one end. So that tries to take any bias out of the sample itself when we load the piece into the machine. Then at that point, we try to get the defect as close as we can within those third points. Am I running over my time? All right, any other questions? Um, my number's up here. Feel free to call me. Um, good luck.